Curtis, the time of the week again, the, the best time in my personal opinion, PBT <laughs> Extra. Uh, we have a lot to talk about. Robert Sarver uh, being suspended and fined. Uh, Donovan Mitchell, the trade finally happened. The trade that you, were, you anticipated, um, the premonition that you had months and months and months ago finally happened. Different location, though. And uh, the WNBA finals, it looks like the aces are about to win it all. But first and foremost, at least on all of our conversations, how are you doing? Your daughter's about to go to college, right? My uh, daughter goes off to college uh, this weekend, goes up to UC Santa Barbara. And uh, hey, man, if I have to spend a few days, a couple days in Santa Barbara helping her move in, which means I just spend a couple days in Santa Barbara, then I'm OK with that. <laughs> like, I'm, I am good with some some extra time up there and I'm excited for her. I'm, it's it's weird. It's going to be just weird not having her around every day. But um, I'm, I'm excited for her. She's going to be great. So aside that, you know, how have you been? You were uh, you got to see. Look, you were in Columbus. You were. Yeah, I didn't think I was going to go, Kurt. And then uh, I got a last minute call, and it made, I ended up going out there to write and do some you know, some postcards for NBC Sports. And you know, as as a Notre Dame fan, it was very tough. And I was actually at Marshall last weekend too yeah, for that, that historic one. game. Also very tough as as a Notre Dame fan. Currently, I'm I'm in a, I'm in a state of mourning. Uh, so what I ended up doing was I ended up I'm, I'm reading Dante's Inferno right now to cheer me up. <laughs> And uh, like reading there, <laughs> and I'm hoping, I'm hoping as I descend through the circles of hell, uh, I'll get a little, you know, hope as we reach purgatory and then eventually paradise. So I'm hoping that the Notre Dame football season goes through the same, you know, uh, the same flow. Uh, we yeah. just need Virgil to lead us. If you see Freeman in there, let me know. If well, let me know what level he's on at this point. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's that's kind of how I'm doing. I'm reading a lot of Italian poetry and mourning and Queens. <laughs> I still am eating a lot of pizza, um, and uh, nothing has changed on that front. And still looking at a lot of art. I actually started doing a lot of film stuff too, which is interesting. Um, a lot of I'm, I'm watching a lot of like uh, Shakespeare films. I don't know, like by Lawrence Olivier and by Akira Kurosawa. Oh, so you're kind of like do some, do some, you know, just study some, some learning. Yeah, I could say that there, there's a bunch of I me. Mean, the Polanski did Romeo and Juliet. I mean, there's a lot of kind of classic stuff out there. Yeah, but now let's dive right into uh, our conversation. We have so much to talk about, Kurt, and I've been dying to get your take on this, Robert Sarver. Um, he's been suspended. The year-long investigation by the NBA um, has come to a close, resulted in a year-long suspension um, where he cannot be anywhere near both the Phoenix Suns and the Phoenix Mercury facilities. Um, and the team, sorry, he has been fined $10 million in maximum permitted by the NBA constitution and bylaws. Um, what effect is this going to have on, on these two teams, the Mercury and the Suns? I think that that's going to be really interesting um, and, and how the players react because you know, we're less than two weeks now from the opening of training camp and for, for the NBA. And the second Chris Paul sits down at that table, the second Devin, you know, Devin Booker sits down at the table to talk about the upcoming season. The first question is going to be about Sarver and the second question. And, and they're, how they handle it is going to be really interesting. This is Corey. This is a team that led the league in wins last year that we I thought were kind of the favorites going into the playoffs. And uh, obviously the, the loss to Dallas, especially getting just crushed in the last game, kind of it left questions, right? I, I'll put it politely aside the bad taste in your mouth. It leaves questions about where they go. And there's a lot of on the court, you know, is this Cam Johnson going to start? Does Jay Crowder want to be there? Is there more DeAndre? And there's all these basketball interesting questions and it's how they're going to deal with, I don't want to say being overshadowed, but at least to start the camp, like the first questions are going to be about Sarver. And it'll also be interesting to see, look, there's a lot, I don't think it's a secret. I wrote about this. I think there's a lot of people around the league who thought the punishment was light. Is there going to be pressure on the players to deal with that? Or are they going to be more, you know, how is Chris Paul and company going to handle this? Are they just going to be like, Hey, that was the league's decision. The league made its choice. You know, we're here to play basketball or are they going to take a more activist role? I, I think there's a lot, it's going to be just the Phoenix Suns media day got a lot more interesting, Corey. Absolutely. It's, um, and it's interesting too, when, when you think about the, the, um, the vocal leaders, like you said, Chris Paul is one of the most vocal leaders in, yeah. in the entire NBA, uh, particularly on social justice issues. So when you think about this this investigation, which, by the way, last year you, you mentioned this team performed extremely well in the face of this investigation. 
yeah. like mid investigation. And I thought, okay, talk about a distraction. Monty Williams still won coach of the year. The team was still great, you know? So in that sense, um, with DeAndre Aiden not getting that uh, extension, that max extension, with, in that sense, I, I was actually very surprised to see the resiliency of this team, the Phoenix Suns. And then you add in this year, Phoenix Mercury, Brittany Griner's overseas, everything that's going yeah. on with her detention in Russia. I mean, there, there was so much around that team as well. Diana Taurasi, is she healthy? Is she going to retire? Like, you know, all these questions that they're yeah. dealing with as well. Um, a new coach with Sandy Brunello. So there was there was all these things around Phoenix as an organization, both NBA and WNBA, but still that idea of championship aspirations. But when you add in the ownership question, in my mind, my eyes go straight to the WNBA first. Because in basketball, it seems as though the WNBA is always first in leading when yeah. it comes to these yeah. issues. And I am just reminded of Kelly Loeffler. Remember that with the Atlanta Dream? Oh, yeah. No, oh, yeah. Where uh, the owner clashed with the players. It then resulted in the players being so vocal to actually cheer for and support and go create like a voting movement for it her. Changed, yeah. And then get her, out of, the election. get her out of ownership. Yeah. I don't think it, I don't. I don't want to say it changed that election, but it certainly changed part of the tone of it, right? Like it, it, it had, and the WA's WNBA's activism on that front had an impact, like at the ballot box. And so, yeah, I, I am curious as well. I, the how is the WNBA going to do deal with this? And also, what's the power structure like? Is there a power vacuum? Who's making? WNBA, you know, they're going to head into free agency. They're going to head into the draft. Um, who's making decisions about how much we're willing to spend, what moves we're willing to make? Obviously, I think we're all just all hoping Brittany Griner's back next season. Um, and that's a little beyond their control, but they've got a lot of other decisions. And then the same sort of with the Suns, right? Like they're going to go into the season. Jay Crowder's kind of pushing for a trade. Are they going to make a move? What happens when they get to the trade deadline? Would they... They're in the tax. Are they going to find ways to lower that number or do they care? Like there's ownership level decisions that somebody's going to have to make. And the suspension, just I'm going to read it here uh, from the NBA's statement. Um, Robert Sarver cannot be present at any NBA or WNBA team facility, including any office arena or practice facility, cannot attend or participate in any NBA or WNBA event or activity, including games, practices or business partner activity, represent the Suns or Mercury, Mercury in any public or private capacity have any involvement with the business or basketball operation of the Suns or Mercury, or have any involvement in the business governance or activities of either the WNBA or the NBA, including attending or participating in meetings of either league's board and their associated board committee. So you're right. I mean, you're, you're, taking, you're talking about all the things that you just mentioned, um, who's going to sign off on those things and, yeah. and help these teams achieve their, their championship aspirations. And is this going to shorten them the championship window for the Suns? In addition to, you know, the, the fundamental question of, well, how will the, the players react? Do they even want to play for yeah. an owner like this? That's the first question. And like I said, my eyes will go straight to the WNBA to see how that will, how they will react and respond. And I think that will then precipitate um, the, the NBA's reaction. And, you know, to have Chris Paul there, that's going to be, especially on the short window, um, and he's the key to their success in the championship. If he's not into it, then that's going to be, uh, I, I think we're going to see a, a potential implosion uh, in Phoenix. Yeah. I, I I would just say, I think it's pretty clear that Adam Silver and the NBA owners did not want to go farther with this, with, uh, you know, a more severe, more stiff punishment or, or whatever steps they might've taken with Sarver in part because he was going to push back. He reportedly wasn't happy with this. Um he's not going to just take this line down. So if they are not going to go farther, it's going to be up to the players or some other mechanism to, of public pressure to, to change that. If anything's going to change it, because the league is pretty set. They don't really want to go there. Um, and they, they would probably have to be pushed that way. But when you think about Adam Silver's um, relationship with the owners, you know, even like, let's go back to like Donald, Donald Sterling. Remember that, that um, back when was that? 20, 2014. Yes. Uh, it seems like he's taken a pretty strong stance historically. Yeah, yeah uh, I think I think Sterling was a different situation on a couple of fronts. A, there was absolutely a smoking gun. There is not, we're not listening to audio tapes of Robert Sarver. We all heard the audio tapes of, of Donald Sterling and it's it's just more visceral that way, right? Like when you see a video or you hear that audio, it's different than reading it in a report, whether whether that's fair or not, or whether, you know, the, the list of the crime, it's just, 
it had that reaction, but it also happened right in the playoffs with Chris Paul and those guys kind of reacting on the court. And you, it wasn't just them. Like LeBron James at the time was quoted as saying Sarver has, you know, not Sarver has to go, but basically Sarver. Has. Like there was a pushback from other fans. And the bigger issue for the league was State Farm pulled back from Clippers and some advertising on Clippers games. Same with Kia, same with Corona, same with CarMax. Like once the sponsors started getting involved, once you look, man, it's still a business. Once you hit the bottom line, all the other owners felt and Adam Silver felt differently. That hasn't happened here, at least to this point. And part of what's going on is this got dropped in the deadest part of the NBA offseason, right? Like there is nothing going on. There's, you know, we're talking about this now. Fans are listening to this and thinking about it. And tomorrow night, there's an NFL game. And this weekend, you know, there's there's pressure on Notre Dame. There are big college football games. And we're going to move the WNBA finals. The baseball playoffs are coming up and those chases. And I think it is possible that the sporting psyche moves on from this and it never reaches the crescendo it did with Sterling. We will see. Keep an eye on that. Uh, one of the biggest stories this offseason that you've been right on the nose, uh, Don Mitchell, how upset or, you know, it just seems I would say not upset, but rather um, <laughs> it looked as though they were, the tensions were frayed. How about that? Yes. Yeah. And he, he was traded to the Cavaliers. So this is an interesting move. Um, we thought it was going to be New York yeah. and it ended up being Cleveland and the Jazz, we, we we thought, okay, well, what is the price of Donovan Mitchell, an all-star player with the potential of being a superstar in the league someday? Uh, we saw what the price tag for Rudy Gobert was, astronomical. What was his price tag? Lori Markkinen, uh, Ochai Agbaji, coming out of Kansas, Good Colin player. Sexton. That's the big one. Uh, three unprotected first-round picks, huge, 2025, 2027, and 2029, and two pick swaps, 2026 and 2028. Do you think this was – a good move. Yeah. I first off for the, for the jazz, I, look, they got a lot of picks, a lot of pick swaps. They're going to be able to flip Laurie Markin in, into something. I don't think he'll end the season with the jazz. They got Colin Sexton. If you play fantasy, Colin, <laughs> I, I'm telling you, if you're a fantasy basketball player, pick up Colin Sexton. Now, like the, the first, the, not first round guy. He's not up there with Luca or what Embiid or whatever, but get him early. Somebody there, this guy exists on every season, right? There is a good, nice player, a good player putting up monster numbers on a terrible team because somebody's got to score. That's Colin Sexton this year. He is gonna he's gonna put up killer fantasy numbers for you. Um I, I get why the Jazz did it. I think honestly, Corey, I, I and I've asked this question of others, I'll ask of you. I you get three unprotected Cavaliers picks. The Knicks were only offering two. Would you rather have three Cavaliers picks with them having this roster, or would you rather have two Knicks unprotected picks? I mean, the way that the NBA works right now when you're talking about rebuilding, because this is what this is, by the way. Yeah, yeah. In Utah, complete rebuilding. Yeah. Um, I think more picks is is a good thing. Uh, but it's interesting because, for me, I don't understand this. And this is just, you know, between you and me and all of our friends listening. I, I just don't understand <laughs> the mentality because – in, in like traditional rebuilding, you would want to accumulate as many picks as possible, right? And then hope you get a lottery where maybe you get someone like a Giannis or a Luka or a LeBron, right? Where you can Wemby then build around. It's, it's, this, is, this is the Wembyama Scoot Henderson draft. <laughs> and, then, and then what ends up happening, though, in today's NBA, due to the fact that people aren't, you know, maturing until their fourth or fifth or sixth, basically their second deal. Uh, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth, yeah. seventh year in the league, their second deal or so. That's when they become the players that you know that what what you're going to get from them. Um, to me, these first round picks don't mean as much, which is interesting because you know that that's that's like the 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 classic playbook, and I think yeah. it's kind of failing. But if I have to go classic playbook, I would rather have more more picks than than possible. You know, than than, than yeah. possible. So that's kind of my 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 take. What about your? Yeah, uh, yeah, no, I I I'd be hesitant. I just think. I think the Cavaliers have the chance. They're going to be good and have the chance to be very good for a number of years. The Knicks historically are more likely to mess this up. <laughs> Let's be honest. Like just historically, like I might be more tempted to take them, but I, I get where they're at with this. I will. If you notice 
these picks and pick swaps all start in 25 and after, which is when Donovan Mitchell's look, he's on a three-year deal, but he would you know, 25 is when that deal comes up. There's a little bit of a bet there, I think, by the Jazz that, you know, who knows? Does Donovan, does Donovan Mitchell want to be in Cleveland long term? And he reportedly is very happy right now. If that team is winning, he very well may stay. But I think there's a bit of a bet that, hey, is he going to stay there or might we luck out? And by the way, I'm not sure how much that helps because I think Evan Mobley is amazing. They've got Jared Allen. They've got like locked up Darius Garland. Like, that's a pretty good team. That's a solid team, even without Mitchell. So I, I, I like I like this. By the way, I do like this for Cleveland. What about you? I think this is it's a bit of a gamble, but like a good gamble. No, I, I think Cleveland definitely won here. Uh, I think that they, they're in a really good position. I think that Evan Mobley, like you mentioned, he's one of the, the bright young stars coming up. I think what they're trying to do, it's funny. Minnesota tried to do this, right? Rudy Gobert, Carl Anthony Towns. They wanted a, 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 a two big man kind of structure. And then Cleveland ended up doing the same thing, right? With, with, with now, but it's much younger, but with Jared Allen and, um, and Mobley with now two slashers, you know, in, in, in Garland and in Mitchell. I, I think on paper, I think this is definitely they're moving up into that four to six space in yeah. the Eastern Conference, which is interesting because this is where we start getting a little like, you know, I'm walking on eggshells here. because I don't want to hope. I'm very hesitant to hope with Cleveland. <laughs> Any non-LeBron Cleveland teams, I'm very hesitant to hope yeah. with. Um, but to me, they're knocking on the door of the Philadelphia 76ers, which in that Eastern Conference, like, because I think five and six is like totally up for grabs, yeah. right? I think the top three are very clearly established with, you know, Miami, Boston, and Milwaukee. I think those three are the, at the top, you know, up, up echelon. Yeah. I think Philadelphia is number four squarely in that position. But I think that they are so wildly elemental where they could be really good or really bad, uh, where I think a solid team that's talented like Cleveland could actually give the 76ers a run for their money, which is shocking. And then I think Brooklyn is actually in that four to six conversation yeah, too, well, just because it's so unstable. They're the wild card. I look for me, it's kind of Celtics bucks who I trust to be good this season. You get into a, like, I don't want to say a second tier, but like, I think the 76ers are going to win a lot of regular season games. I think that they're going to be a good team. Do I trust James Harden in the playoffs is a, a question to be answered. Like, I'm not sure that I trust him the way, like, I know Jason Tatum will be fine. Like, I, I know Giannis will be fine. I'm not, we'll see. But I think they're going to win a lot, of, a lot of regular season games. You know the Heat are going to play hard, get the most out of their guys. That's four, right? You're yeah. already at four. The Nets could be amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And we haven't, you know, now you get into Cleveland. And what the other team we didn't mention is Toronto, which is a, they finished in the playoffs last year. They are, I'm, man, they're just, they're just weird, to, tough to play against. They are a different kind of team because they're just a lot of six, six, four to six, nine guys who are all switchable. Uh, they shoot the three. They, when they're running in the regular season, when they can really get out and run in transition and not rely on that, form, they're really good. That is a really good team that plays really good defense. And they, ease, they could finish in there. Well, now we've listed seven teams. One of those teams ends up like in the play in. Like it's not mm. the East is deep with good teams this year. And Cleveland's going to have to. I like them as a playoff team. I think they're a top six team, but they're going to have to earn it. Like they're going to have to show it. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think um, I, I agree. I think they took a huge step forward. To me, they were kind of like um, the Pelicans, you know, when they got yeah. to get them, where I was like, oh, wow, like that was a team that maybe potentially could go somewhere. And then when they got CJ, it was okay, this is an exciting team to kind of to look forward to. And then when they add Zion back, where could they go? And that was like Darius Garland in the play, you know, last year against the Nets, like that idea to me, I was like, wow, like this Cleveland team is interesting. I don't think they're there yet, but now with Donovan Mitchell, it's kind of like, well, how far could they go? And I think it's a very interesting thought experiment. I do want to say Laurie Markman, um, I think he's an interesting character yeah. just his, his his nba career so far because chicago took a bet on him didn't work out right cleveland took a bet didn't work out you, you mentioned he probably won't even spend the whole season in utah so it's it's kind of like well what is his role going to be moving forward because he has this unbelievable like on paper skill set skill set where you're thinking he could be really good like he just dropped yeah. over 40 
recently. You know, over he's, he's, he's been fantastic at Euro Cup in, in yeah. Euro Basket, I should say. And he's been one of the best. I mean, Giannis has been the best player because he's the best player on the earth. Like Giannis <laughs> has been amazing, right? And, and Greece still got eliminated, but um, Laurie Markin has been fantastic. In but, but it hasn't translated to his NBA career yet, which no, is it interesting. Not. It's interesting. So, yeah, so I think as far as the, the Jazz are concerned, I think you're right. Fantasy, it's it's a gold mine for fantasy players. Yeah. Colin Sexton, I think, uh, is going to be kind of like the the one buoy for them, you know, yeah. keeping them somewhat afloat. Because um, right now, this is going to be a dark, dark era for, in Utah until they. And by the way, get, so. Utah's not done. Like, let's yeah. be clear. Boyan Bogdanovich, Jordan Clarkson. Um, I've heard they they want to hang on to Beasley. We'll see. Um, I'm forgetting some people there. They've got a, a number of veterans still on the roster that may very well be moved by the start of the season. Certainly will be moved by, and Mark and there, like will be moved by the time we get to the trade deadline. Like they're not done. They're, they're not, outside of Bogdanovich. I'm not sure they're getting a first round pick for anybody who's left, but they're not done moving guys. Yes. And, and as far as, um, one last note on Mitchell, I think this is going to be just interesting psyche wise for him, you yeah. know, to, to kind of think about just the, the, to, to traject, the trajectory that he's kind of been through where you have rising star out of the bubble to one of the best teams in the NBA to um, not being able to have, you know, excellent performances in the postseason to the, you know, in, in team fighting or whatever. Um, and Ainge's comments recently about how this team didn't believe in each other last season. I think that was a very revealing comment about, yeah. you know, that leadership in that locker room. But this is a, a clean slate, a chance to be reborn, right? And I think this opportunity of rebirth for Donovan Mitchell should be interesting because of the way that, you know, he operates, at least, you know, publicly as someone who's, I think, very stoic and very focused on leadership. I wonder how he then comes into Cleveland, you know, reborn with this new idea of another chance to lead a team that has all the pieces, the, you know, the groundwork is there for them to be a top six team. So I, I think this could be an interesting leaping emergent kind of uh, spot for, for Donovan Mitchell, just to throw it out there. I agree. And by the way, I think if Ke the Cavaliers fans are going to love him. His players are going to love him. I don't think there's a, he is a good leader. He's a little bit quiet, but I don't think there's like a nicer guy who's more active in the community. Like, he was very active in the community in in Utah, and I, I imagine he will be in Cleveland as well. So one thing that we mentioned earlier, this idea of the WNBA moving, kind of moving first, being the first mover yeah. in basketball, and then the NBA following, uh, it also I think serves not only on the social justice aspect, but also just as far as how they operate the season. I think there it's like an incubator for, um, yep. for the NBA as far as ideas are concerned. One idea was the Commissioner's Cup. Um, this is in the second year that it's been going on. You've seen a little bit of tinkering with it, but it's an interesting idea uh, of an in-season tournament. The NBA could have a single elimination in-season tournament. What are your, what's your take on this? This idea of maybe eight teams playing in this in this in-season tournament? Yeah, I think the idea is sort of like the Commissioner's Cup. There would be games in the first part of the season to determine who those eight teams are and then have those eight teams go into a single elimination. I, there's some logistical questions about how that's going to work. If, if I don't know, we were talking about the Celtics and bucks, if the Celtics and bucks make the, you know, those eight and they play in the second round of this, you know, the final four or whatever, does that count towards a regular season game? And then I mean, how, I mean, like there's just, there's some logistical questions I don't understand. Um, the Commissioner's Cup's kind of worked in the WNBA. Um, my question is, just remains, Corey, and, and this, we'll never, we'll find out when they do it, because they will do it. Are fans going to care? I mean, I just, I. No, probably not. Yeah, see, I, this is, they're doing it the first part of the season. The games, that the, the cup games will be in, you know, which are regular season games that count double, will be in October and November, and then they'll go into this single elimination tournament thing. Um, again, that's right in the middle of football season. I know that they're trying to look for the league. It provides a second cup. It provides more interest in theory in the early part of the season, but you've talked about this before. What, what is it that attracts, what makes uh, part of what makes football so attractive, why the playoffs are attractive. What are we drawn to as fans? 
games with meaning, games with weight, games with, I think you used the word jeopardy, which I think is a mm -hmm. great word for what we want. We want something on the line. I don't know if the early season, you know, this mid season tournament idea is going to have that kind of weight. Yeah. I'm all for, I'm all for new ideas though. I, I think that's yeah. cool. The, the fact that one of the biggest sporting you know, leagues in the world is, is willing to be entrepreneurial, I think is a very exciting move. Um, and it's reflected by that spirit of innovation. Now, I agree with you. I don't think it will matter. I, I think it's one of those, it's kind of like when they redid like the rookie game, remember that in the, in the all-star games? Like well, yeah. no one really cared in the first place. <laughs> so, <laughs> so redoing the rookie game to a new, to make it more competitive or more, you know, it's like, it's, that's just, it's novel, but like, I still didn't watch it. You know, it's still yeah. not interesting. And I, you know, and I love basketball and it's still not interesting enough for me. Same with the all-star game where like the quality of the game has just, just gone so bad, like so far down because it, it comes down to a, a will question, not a structure question. Yeah. You know, back in the nineties, people wanted to play in that game because there was pride on the line of like, you know, this is almost like in my mind, the way it worked. And, you know, there, there was this element of like, okay, well you go out there and you're going to play hard. Now yeah. the only play, person who plays hard, you know, like recent years, you know, was like someone like a Kawhi Leonard or something, but then he, has, he hasn't really been playing because of his injuries this this all-star game has just kind of become like a like a almost like entertainment yeah and i understand like maybe that people are into that but it, it's not basketball it's not competition um so i think with this this tournament i think it would have been much more interesting if they would have followed the soccer model because to me this is a soccer model idea yeah. right like like we're, we're watching right now in the premier league and all over europe people like resting players in, in advance for the, the world cup like especially psg when they have messi Neymar, yeah. and Mbappe, um, coming off the bench at different times now to get them ready for the World Cup. That to me is interesting. Now, if there was if there was an idea of okay, you want to grow the, grow the game globally, and you want to have you know the Basketball Africa League, or maybe a, you know a league from China, like you want to have maybe a European league or you know Eurobasket, you want to have these kind of in season tournament breaks where Giannis can go play for Greece, you know, yeah. for a couple of weeks, or like or you know Luca can go play. You know, I think that is an interesting concept. But for an in-season tournament for the NBA, locked in within the NBA, insulated in the NBA, I think you're going to have the same effect as what we see during All-Star Weekend, which is a novel innovation, but nothing, no substance. The, the, those in-season tournaments, whether you, you, know, you talk about soccer, the FA Cup, the Carling Cup in England, whatever, all these other ones, it's baked into the DNA of the sport, right? And they also, in the Premier League, there isn't a playoff structure at the end of the season. If you you win the Premier League by having the most points at the end of the 38 game regular season. There isn't a playoff structure the way we do it here. So I don't know. So those cups have more weight yeah. in some ways because it's just baked into the system. Again, I just, I don't know that it, we'll see. I will be watching. I just, I'm not sure American consumers are going to be moved. Yeah, I agree. WNBA finals. Uh, yeah. We're one game away from crowning a new champion. The, the Las Vegas Aces are up 2 0 on the Connecticut Sun. Um, have you been watching? What, what did you think about the most recent game? Kelsey Plum had a, had a really nice game. Yeah, Kelsey, well, they got their offense going. I mean, Wilson, Aja Wilson has been, I think, five straight 20 and 10 playoff games now, which is just ridiculous. Kelsey Plum had a good game. Uh, Gray has been fantastic for them. I, I'll go back to the first game. I feel for the sun because I think that was you you get a usually in a series like this you get a chance to steal a game on the road and I think that was their game right mm -hmm. they are a defensive team that was a grinding low scoring kind of game right their defense was definitely impacting uh, the aces and they didn't come away with the win the aces still got the victory game 2 was um, it was back and forth a little bit. I don't want to say that they completely like it wasn't some kind of blowout, but it felt more like the aces were in control. They have so much offensive firepower I mean, with Plum and with Wilson and with Gray and, and on and on down the line. Like they're just that team is stacked with talent and they're playing cohesively right now, which is I don't know if you saw the video of Greg Popovich in the locker room with with Becky Hammond talking to the team afterwards and congratulating them on on the continuity and, and beauty of their play. They're playing really good basketball. I, I just, can't, I don't, you know, the sun have to win three in a row now. I just, I, Corey, can you see them doing that? No, I mean, there's been no team actually in the history of the, of the WNBA 
um, playoffs to come back from an yeah. 2 and to win a best of five. So especially with the narrow um, escape that Connecticut had over Chicago to yeah. get in this position in the first place and the confidence, it seems like the, the Aces kind of seem like the best team all year long, you know, like, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of been their moment in that sense. Um, I'm thrilled for Asia Wilson. I think she's awesome. I think yeah. she's an unbelievable player. And I do love the story of Kelsey Plum kind of going through, you know, the rough beginnings of her being number one overall draft pick, kind of figuring her her uh, footing in this league, and then now becoming uh, a great teammate, a great player in this league. And uh, Becky Hammond is kind of heir apparent. I, I, there are so many great storylines. It's very hard not to cheer for Las Vegas. And, you know, they used to be the San Antonio Silver Stars. So. <laughs> they did. I'm just going to throw that out there. That that uh, that connection is still there, and they are. You're right. They've they've had the most talent. I think they've been the most best team much of the season. And when they didn't, it's because they weren't as dialed in on defense. They could win games by outscoring teams, and just because of the talent on the roster, some nights. And but when they've when they've been focused on the defensive end um, and getting some stops, it's just it's hard to beat them because they. You know, how do you stop a team with that many scoring weapons? It's, you know, it's, it's vintage warriors or whatever other, you know, team you want to compare them to. It's like, there's too many weapons to stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tomorrow, uh, tomorrow night is we're recording this on Wednesday. So uh, Thursday night, 9 PM Eastern game three, game three. tune in. Uh, but now it's funny. I, I used to be a huge gamer. This is, you know, it's always the best part of, of the, of the, the show. When <laughs> you and I get to talk about something fun, and a little, yeah. little left field. We've done food, you know, we've done um, uh, all sorts of things today though. Not retro jerseys, we're talking <laughs> gaming. Do you play NBA 2K? I do not, I am not much of a gamer. Um, uh, but I am actually, I believe still in the game um, as part of the, you know, the, the Twitter feed that pops up if you start a league and-, and You're in you the know, game. game get, stories get broken by, you know, Shams and there's the, the 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 debate between that goes on on the fake Twitter. I'm in there somewhere. I am. I, wow. I, so, yeah. congratulations. <laughs> it's yeah. It's, I, I get, every once in a while I'll get a hey, you just were mean to me on 2K <laughs> like DM. I'm like, dude, I don't write the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually that's a huge flex, Kurt. I'm really shook right now. I mean, if, if I was, if I were you, that would be my fun fact, you know, just like, especially when I go hang out with, you know, like high schoolers or like, you know, call up because be like, Hey guys, just by the way, fun fact, I'm in 2k. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to throw that out more. I, I don't use that enough. No, I mean, that's like a huge flex. Um, wow. Congratulations. Uh, I'm a little in awe. Yeah. So the uh, it's interesting when, to me, I used to be a huge gamer, like used to be a huge gamer. In recent years, I have opted for more Italian poetry than gaming. <laughs> Dante's Inferno. I'd rather I'd, I'd rather read Dante than play 2K at this stage of my life. But I love, love, love the conversations around the game yeah. as far as players or ratings are concerned because I think it's comical. I, I really do. I, I think it's just so funny, like how important the ratings are to people. Oh my God! So I'm going yes. to read you the top ten um, right now. Giannis, 97 overall. Um, Kevin Durant. Steph Curry, LeBron James, Nikola Jokic, Joel Embiid, they're all tied at 96 overall. Uh, Luka, 95 overall. Kawhi Leonard, 94. Jason Tatum and John Morant, both 93. And then right around the top 10, you're looking at number 11, Jimmy Butler, 93. Devin Booker, 91. And Chris Paul, 90. Uh, to me, what stands out there is, I mean, LeBron, Chris Paul, like, you know, they're like, they're like over 36. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're still in these, in these high ratings. That's amazing. Yeah. I, 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 and I, it's weird. I, I'm wondering with the Suns long-term, like what if Chris Paul, you know, they need a lot of things to go right to win this year. What if Chris Paul takes half a step back? Um, but you've got to rate him that high. He's been so good the last few seasons. Also is Luca, it's one point, but is Luca behind and be in all those guys? Yeah, I'm not so sure. Game. Like I'm, I get having Giannis as the highest rated because I I will still say that he's the best player, walking the face of the earth today. But man, I've been again watching some EuroBasket, watching Luca 
shooting, running across his body, right-handed threes over Rudy Gobert and knocking them down. Like there's just nothing that guy can't do. Um, I, I, if I'm going to play as somebody, I got a feeling I'm going to take Luca just because I know I can do everything. It's funny because Steph Curry, you know, I don't know if you read that Rolling Stone profile of him recently, yeah. uh, but, but you know, when, when they won the championship, he got his finals MVP at the long side off sought after finals MVP. Um, he said, what are they going to say now? And now it's like, man, like 96 rating in 2K. It's kind of like, it's like, it's like, I feel like there's always some, like some sort of motivation aspect. It, it, it always gets you going. There's always something, you know, Giannis is rated higher than me. Um, but, but it is interesting. Like this, I think that the, the rating question to me is always comes down to like, it's the fun debate of, yeah, uh, you know, who's the greatest of all time, which to me is a silly debate, but I do think it's a fun one. And, and I kind of like, um, I don't know. I kind of like how, how comical it is, how players are so offended by their their rating. I just think it's just really interesting as, as if this matters, you know, um, it's just funny to me. Yeah. Well, and if you ever talk to Ronnie too, who K who's kind of the, he's on Twitter, but he's kind of the face, the PR guy, the kind of the face of the 2k uh, game to NBA Twitter and to the world, like players angrily DM him. And he's just like, he's like, my response is usually like, well, play well. And your rating bumps up during the season, right? Like, like you can affect your rating, but they, but they get genuinely angry about this. Yeah, it's funny because, like, on one hand, I mean, I think this is the difference. I think between like Madden and Two K, you know, is, um, and I think even just look at the name of the game, right? Like Madden's named after a coach and a broadcaster, you know, versus Two K. I think is more about the league, you know, and about the players. So I, I think in that instance. Um, like when like the NFL does their, you know, top 100 or whatever, you get to be part of like, you know, this, you know, uh, this, this elite club, there's a huge, you know, uh, there's a huge fanfare around that, but it's, I don't think anywhere close to the reception and to the respect and the esteem that like being a part of like the NBA 2K, like, you know, elite uh, rarefied air is because I think it's like much more interwoven into the fabric of the NBA as far as like culture wise, you know, um, I think so. In that sense, it's it's funny. I think with with Madden, most people played Madden and they learned the game through Madden, right? Right. Whereas I think a lot of NBA players grew up playing 2K and they envisioned themselves in 2K. Does that make does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, and it's but like, different. you're not wrong about how embedded. I mean, I, I don't think it's every, but mo- a bunch of NBA teams have like they have 2K teams, right? Like they they there is a league where the NBA teams draft these guys and they compete against each other and travel around. And, and uh, it is a big deal. It, it, there is a lot of people and a lot of money on the line following this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And with the, with the rise of esports, to me, it's kind of like iRacing with, with like NASCAR and stuff, you know, I don't know if you know all that stuff, but it's kind of fun. Like you have race car drivers who are just like, they just do iRacing. They kind of like, it's like practicing for them. I, I feel like with, basketball is just you're you're always playing basketball you're always thinking about basketball you always yeah. play basketball video games it's just kind of like it's just all consuming you're just playing 2k it's just so in that sense I, I do think it's much more akin to like racing um which is kind of which is kind of interesting um but anyways that's that's the top 10 if you were in 2k i have to know um what <laughs> what do you think your rating would be my rating oh god <laughs> 12 how low can it go? Like, what's the bottom? You wouldn't be 97? No, I would not be. I would, um, if left wide open to set his feet, his slow shot from three can land sometimes is not a great scouting report. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know. What, what would yours? You, look, you're high I, 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 feel like, I feel like I can't shoot, so I'm definitely not going to get, you know, like, uh, so if I'm looking at, like, the top three point shooters, nowhere near Steph Curry. <laughs> Kevin Durant, Clay, Desmond Bain, I mean, Luke Kennard, they're all really, you know, I can't, can't compete with them. I'm thinking dunkers, maybe, you know, like, I, you know, I feel like that's the one area of my game. I, I can do some decent dunks. So I feel like, look at the best dunkers here. Number one is John Morant. Can't touch him. He's yeah, at 97. Dion, I mean, that's, these guys are like at a different level. 97, Zach Levine, 95, uh, Edwards, 95, Aaron Gordon, 95. But I feel like, I can compete with, you know, actually, no, no. <laughs> I feel like I may be top four, 40. No, I have no, I, yeah, I can't do it. 
I don't know what it would be. Probably in the 70s. Yeah, yeah, yeah you can still get up there and play. Right? But I would definitely I would try to be a dunker, you, though. If I, if I had well, a team, it's like, starting to get chilly. Aren't you getting out and playing some pickup at the park in New York? No, I used to play pickup here in the park, and it didn't go well. And I, I, I almost like – um, I almost messed up my knee, Kurt. You know, it's just like the older wow. you get, and you don't, and you don't play basketball regularly. Oh it's yeah, no, no. like stay away from the courts. Yeah, even when I was playing regularly, I, as I got older, I was like, yeah, that shouldn't feel that way. Like there was. Yeah, I, I think to end my my comment, I don't know what I'd be rated, but I would definitely be. I would definitely go for dunkers, and I would definitely want to be the one of the best dunkers in the game. I would play for the Spurs, obviously. And uh, I, would, yeah. I would want to just like write my name in the lore of the slam dunk contest. I, I would take out, this is just an aside, going more from 2K into real life. If, if I could do that, <laughs> I would <laughs> take out all the props of the slam dunk contest. You know, it wouldn't be like a, like a show. And I would go back oh. to what it was a, like meant to be, which is dunking, dunking fast, dunking hard. And I would just try to like, you know, be like Dominique Wilkins. That's kind of like what I would try to do. Yeah. For like, in, you know, in 2K. That'd be impressive. So, anyways, uh, that ends up our, uh, <laughs> our our super producer just told me my, my rating is ninety two at Rutgers Park, which is not true. <laughs> Definitely not. But <laughs> thanks, Dan, for the for the vote of confidence. So uh, that wraps up the fun section. As always, Kurt, it's a pleasure. Uh, if anyone wants to know more about the work that you're doing, they can just go to pbtextra.com um, com backslash NBA for more information. Kurt, I look forward to it. And look forward to talk to you soon, man.